And uh, I feel like every time I get up here, I have to say, man, I'm, I'm excited to, to worship with you. I'm excited to open up God's word with you. I want you to know that I really mean that. I'm so thankful that as the regular tenor of our life as God's people, that we have really the privilege of being able to gather together, crowded as we are, to lift high the name of Jesus and worship. You know, there are places where your brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the farthest thing from their experience we get to do this openly and freely, and that week by week, we get to sit under the proclamation of line by line, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph through the word of God. And now to continue in our study this morning, Runaway Grace, we're studying the book of Philemon and considering God's grace in our lives and what kind of people that ought to make us to be. And so if you don't already have your Bibles, turn there. Why don't you go ahead and turn to Philemon? I'll join you there in a minute. As I was preparing this week, I wondered if you could uh, think of some examples in your life. Uh, what are some things that you've experienced? What are some things that have happened to you that have altogether altered your priorities, altered the way that you think about your time and your life, the way that you organize your schedule on a weekly basis? We've just crested into a new year. Lots of people have uh, fitness goals that are altering their priorities, right? So they're thinking differently about the food they buy at the store and the way they spend their time, maybe exercising. Uh, we have lots of people in this room who have academic goals or career goals, and those things have a way of altering our priorities, right? Or what about this one? I thought almost instantaneously of marriage. Marriage has a way of altering our priorities, doesn't we? We have a lot of people in this room, a lot of young people in this room who are engaged to be married, aspiring to be married, pre preparing to be married. And we've got uh, older people in our church family who have decades behind them of marriage, and they know that marriage has a significant way of altering your priorities, right? I know for me, when before I got married, if I was hungry, for example, wanted to go out to eat, I'd hop on Yelp, find a place, go there, and eat. Super easy. When you get married, there's a change in your priorities, right? You have somebody else to consider. Married people in the room, tell me if this conversation sounds remotely familiar. Hey, love, you hungry? You want to go get something to eat? Sure, that sounds great. Great, why don't you pick a place? Ah, I don't really want to pick, you pick. Okay, great. How, how do wings sound? Ah, I'm not really feeling wings. Okay, that's fine. How about, uh, how about pizza? Ah, too much cheese. Too much cheese, we're Mexican. What do you mean too much cheese? <laughs> All right, fine, what about, uh, about Chick-fil-A, right? God's chicken, that's always, that's great, right? Ah, Chick-fil-A last week. Okay, okay, great. But you said I can pick, right? Yeah, you pick, you pick, I don't want to pick. Okay, what about Chinese? I had Chinese last week. Okay, that's it. An alteration of your priorities, right, happens when you're married. There's somebody else to consider in that equation there. Or how about when you become a parent, right? We've got a lot of young parents in the room, a lot of new parents in the room, a lot of people who've had kids, right? Before you are a parent, man, you're flying down the I-10 at like 89 miles an hour. You got that check engine light that's been on six months, a half-deflated tire, your old stinky gym bag in the back seat, Right? But after you have kids, all of that changes, right? That first drive home from the hospital, you got a little one strapped back there. Man, you're driving 10 miles on, under the speed limit. Your hands are at 10 and 2. Maybe you don't bump 50 Cent or Post Malone. I, I don't even know who that is. Um, <laughs> but like your Spotify wrapped is all like Coco Melon and Disney tunes now. You realize that there's a reason New Balances have like stood the test of time as a dad shoe. It's not just because they look cool, but they're really, really comfortable, Right? Marriage and kids, they have a way of changing our priorities. What about this? What about when you receive the grace of God? What about when you experience the first time the forgiveness that God has given to you through Christ Jesus? Did that change? Did that alter your priorities? Did that alter the way that you think about your life and your time and your money and the things that you do, the things that you don't do, the way that you treat people? How did it alter the way that you treat people, most especially people that have wounded you. As we continue in our study in the book of Philemon, in our series, Runaway Grace, we are considering how the grace of God, when it meets our lives, significantly alters the people that we are so that we would be people who would be marked by the forgiveness that we have received, that we would lavish forgiveness on even those who have wounded us most deeply. And so if you are in Philemon, uh, I know I just read it, but let me read again for us verses 8 through 16. This is going to be our spiritual food this morning as we study. 
Paul says, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever." No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The big idea that's going to sit over top the passage that we'll study this morning is this. Forgiveness is motivated by radically altered priorities. If we will be those who are marked by forgiveness, if we will be those who will generously lavish the forgiveness that we have received from God on other people, it will be because we are motivated, listen, not by our natural priorities, but by radically altered priorities. And so the question that we're going to seek to ask and answer this morning is this, what priorities motivate forgiveness? What are the priorities that would cause me to be defined as a forgiving person? And so we'll take them one at a time. I think there's three right here in the text that Paul gives us. We'll do it like this. When my priorities are radically altered, number one, love is now my preference. Love is now my preference. So he says, look back down at your Bible. He says, accordingly, now you can think therefore. When he says accordingly, what he's doing is he is transitioning from his introduction to begin to move to the heart of what he wants to set before Paul to consider here. So he says, based on what I've just said, and most notably what he just said is back in the previous verse, Paul has commended Philemon for his brotherly love that has been experienced both by the apostle Paul and his other brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's important that Paul does this at the outset because it is directly at the heart of why Paul is going to appeal to Philemon here. So he says, accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, notice he says, I prefer to appeal to you. He says, there's something that you need to do, Philemon, but uh, instead of calling you to strict obedience, let me see if I can appeal to you first. That should sound familiar to us. Can you think of ways in your life that you have been persuaded to do something by appeal rather than through strict, uh, rigid obedience to some standard? What are some uh, things that you've been influenced to do that maybe are just so happen to be in the best interest of you or the rest of society where you've been appealed to? Or, or rather, what are some things maybe that you've been encouraged to stay away from by virtue of appeal? I don't know how many of you are old enough in this room to remember, but raise your hand if you remember the, the uh, stop smoking campaigns in the early 90s and 2000s. You guys remember this? Man, if you missed it, good good on you on missing it. It was, it was crazy. What they would do is they would put somebody on the screen who had smoked for years and years and years, and now they had like a hole in their throat or they're speaking through a voice modulator. And why'd they do that? I mean, you got the Surgeon General's warning on the side of the pack of the cigarettes, right? It says may cause cancer. Well, apparently that, that wasn't doing it. And so this anti-smoking campaign would put these images on the screen and the goal was either to freak you out so that you, if you thought about smoking, you would quickly change your mind, or if you were a smoker at that point, you would instantly stop. What were they doing? They were appealing to us, right? Through something deeper than simply saying, don't do it. They were appealing to our emotions. And similarly, uh, Paul wants to appeal to something deeper in Philemon here that's most likely to produce the intended result. Or think about uh, campaigns against animal cruelty, Anybody got fur babies in the room? You got fur babies in here? Dog moms and dog dads, raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Y'all seen those like bumper stickers you drive around town that says like who saved who and it's a cute little paw print. And we didn't have any of that growing up in my house. Uh, the, the dogs in my house growing up, they were glorified pests. Like I, I grew up thinking the way that you referred to animals was with like colorful adjectives at various volumes, depending on how well behaved or poorly behaved said dog was on a given day. But then one day, all of, all of that changed for me. All, all it took was watching an infomercial of a poor little puppy behind a chain link fence while Sarah McLaughlin sings in the arms of the angel. She tells me it only takes $19.99 to change a shelter dog's life forever. Oh, and then my little 
shelter mutt is my fur baby and I have way too many photos of him on my phone. That's what Paul is doing here. See, Paul is an apostle. And so he has a divinely given prerogative. If he wants to, he can command Philemon to forgive Onesimus. In fact, even if Paul wasn't an apostle, this isn't Paul's standard that he would appeal to. It's God's own command that Philemon forgive, that Paul could, if he wanted to, call Philemon to strictly obey. And yet that is not his first choice. Rather, Paul appeals to a higher motivation. And that motivation, of course, is love. Now, love for who is the natural question here? Is this Philemon's love for Paul or the church? Or is this Paul's love for Philemon or Onesimus? Or is it Christ's love that has been received by all the parties involved here? And I think you could make an argument for just about all of those. And while it's not immediately obvious, here is what is absolutely obvious here. And it's this, Philemon has been the recipient of the radical, generous, audacious love and grace of God. And up to this point in Philemon's life and his discipleship, that love has already begun to work itself out. And we know that because as we studied last week, Paul has just commended Philemon for his love for him and for the saints. And so now what Paul is doing is he is saying, look, Philemon, like Jesus Your love must go beyond those who are easiest to love, and it must reach people beyond that. Your love, Philemon, like Jesus, must not simply terminate on those who are easiest to love. It must not simply be for those who are in favor with you, but you are called to love even those who have most deeply wounded you. And for us Christians, following the same example of our Lord, our love must reach those who are most difficult to love, namely those who have hurt us. Now, if you are like me even a little bit, you hear that and immediately there are objections rising in your mind. And I do want to address those in just a moment. But just before I do, I just want to remind us, um, You know that Jesus, he washed Judas's feet too, right? You know that Jesus, when he was on the cross, dying, and is praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first people in his mind were not his buddies, right? You know, it's the very ones who murdered him that he's praying for, the very ones who just hours before arrested, maligned, lied about, beat, betrayed him. The ones that even as he dies for the sins of the world, stand mocking at his feet, saying, you Christ, I mean, you said you were going to destroy the temple, build it in three days. If you're the Christ, why don't you just go ahead and why don't you just come down from that cross? You come down, sure, we'll believe that you're the son of God. It is those people that Jesus is interceding for. You know that when Jesus called us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, he was not calling or commanding us to something that he read about in a book somewhere, something that he didn't have any idea what it was like. Jesus understands exactly what he in love is calling us to do. I found this quote from Dorothy Sayers this week to be really helpful. She says this, quote, the incarnation means that for whatever reason God chose to let us suffer, to be subject to sorrows and death, he has nonetheless had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine, end quote. Loving those who love you, now that's easy. And Jesus says anyone can do that. Even the Gentiles Jesus says, even unbelievers can love those who love them. So what? Big deal. But how do we love? How do we forgive those who are hardest to love, the ones that have hurt us the most? How do we do that? Well, it starts when we remember what Christ has done for us, right? When we remember that we have been forgiven and loved by God, we can then bend that love and that forgiveness out to those who are hardest to love and to forgive. You say, um, man, that's really easy for you to say. You have no idea what I've been through. I mean, you have, you have no idea. You can't imagine what they did to me. You, you don't have any 
idea what it was like to grow up in that house. You don't have any idea what it's like to be married to somebody like that. You can't imagine the pain that I still feel every single day. And as I thought about that this week, as I thought about you, and as I prayed for you, I thought that you are right. I probably don't have any idea what that was like. I don't have any idea what that is like. And as your pastor, I just want to tell you, man, I am so sorry. And I've been praying for you this week that God would meet you in that place to heal, to comfort, to help you forgive. But I also need you to know that there is really good news for you. That while I may have no ability to understand or relate to what you have been through, the good news of the gospel is there is one who understands perfectly, and his name is Jesus. The writer of Hebrews tells us that in his incarnation and in his substitutionary death on the cross, Jesus has been made like us. And he has suffered in the same ways we have because our Lord has been betrayed, because he was mistreated, violated, wounded, insulted, rejected, abused. Jesus uniquely has the capacity to relate to us in the midst of our unjust suffering. And you go read First Peter this week, and you see in chapter two how Peter describes Jesus, that in spite of the fact that he had no sin, he suffered as one who had sinned. And you think about that for a moment, and then you remember that it wasn't the sin of the person that hurt you or that hurt me that Jesus is atoning for that Peter is trying to call our attention to. It was your sin and my sin. Peter says, for Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for who? Who is he suffering for? The unrighteous. Paul says in Romans that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Don't you see? Consider how you have been forgiven and loved this morning. If you are here and you know Christ, it is not because you arrived at God's doorstep with a resume of your accomplishments. I was in my barber's chair this week and I was talking to him about some things that I've seen God do in my life recently. And he's just like, well, it's it's because you're a good person, right? No, I'm not a good person. That it it has nothing to do with it. I'm I'm a wicked, sinful person who needs the grace of God. And if we belong to Christ this morning, it is because the Holy Spirit has helped us to recognize that we are destitute, that we are desperate for a Savior to lavish his grace on us. And if he has loved us in spite of who we are, And in spite of what we have done, if he has loved me, in spite of the countless ways that I still sin against him, even today, then how in the world could I withhold grace? How in the world could I withhold forgiveness and love from anyone else? See, when somebody wounds you or wounds me, that is always one sinner sinning against another sinner, right? Now listen, that doesn't make it okay. But when we rebel against our creator, the perfect God who made us and who has loved us, the Bible says, with an everlasting love, when we sin against him, we sin against perfection. We sin against love itself. And yet in spite of that, the Bible says he does not deal with us according to our iniquities. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. He treats us in love and in kindness and with forgiveness. And people will often ask, they'll say, why do Why do bad things happen to good people? And I love the response from one theologian. He says that only ever happened once, and he volunteered. When we recognize the incredible, audacious, lavish, generous, radical love for God, or radical love of God that has been expressed through the substitutionary death of Jesus in our place, in order that we might be forgiven, then we can forgive. We forgive like Christ forgives, and like Jesus, love becomes our preference. Why do you forgive? Why would you forgive this morning? We will forgive when we are motivated by radically altered priorities. What are the priorities that motivate forgiveness? Number one, love is now my preference. Number two, charity is now my pursuit. 
Charity is now my pursuit. Now, charity uh, is not a word that we often use today in this way. Generally, when we hear the word charity, uh, we think of an organization that is uh, set up to help provide uh, money or help or some kind of support for people in need, or it's the voluntary giving of help to those in need. Maybe when you think of City Hope, you think of that as a charity, or maybe you think about the offerings that you give to the church as a charity, and uh, all of those definitions are fine. They're just not what we mean here. This morning, when we talk about charity, we mean uh, charity is a virtue. Uh, Historically, the church has understood charity to be something like this. It is a supreme love for God that expresses itself or is seen uh, in love for others. It is a love for God in the heart of a believer that is of such a quality that it actually consumes and defines everything about that person, and it can be most acutely seen in the way that person treats others. And this virtue, this love, this charity, if you will, is thoroughly seasoned by other virtues of the Christian faith, virtues like grace and kindness and gentleness and humility and hospitality. In fact, so graphic of a concept is this word charity. It is the English word that the translators of the King James uh, version of the Bible used when they translated the Greek word agape, which is translated now in most of your Bibles as love. And so when we use the word charity here, that is the idea we are going for. And so Paul now says, he says, I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Now notice Paul's affection for Onesimus. He's become like a son to him in his old age. And just like you or I would desire that the people that we entrust the care of our children to would treat them with love and kindness and respect, Paul expects the same from Philemon to Onesimus. And then he says, he says, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf for my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent. And then he says, why? He says that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. Now, I don't know if you've been following, but this is now the fourth time just in this little letter uh, that Paul has mentioned that he is in prison. He's reminding Philemon that he's in prison. If you look back at verse one, he says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Then down in verse 9, he says, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Verse 10, whose father I became in my imprisonment. In verse 13, he says, during my imprisonment. Right? So he keeps drawing his attention to the fact that he's in prison. And why, why is Paul in prison? Well, if you're familiar at all with the life of the Apostle Paul, you read the book of Acts and you read the epistles, it's because Paul was faithful to Christ and faithful to the proclamation of the gospel, right? Paul would go from place to place preaching the gospel and people would be like, stop preaching the gospel, bro. And he'd be like, no. And then they would throw him into prison. And why is Paul drawing Philemon's attention to this? What is Paul's imprisonment have to do with Philemon's need to show charity to Onesimus? And what does it have to do with forgiveness and radically altered priorities? Why would we consider this this morning? We'll consider this statement from one commentator. He's, he says this, he says, quote, his general purpose in referring to his imprisonment, that's Paul, is not simply to evoke sympathy from Philemon, but to remind him that commitment to the gospel will often bring suffering or difficulty. If Paul is willing to suffer chains for the sake of the gospel, Philemon should be willing to respond to his erring slave Onesimus with love, end quote. Do you get that? See, Paul's whole life has been turned upside down radically by Christ and the gospel, right? And you go read the life of the apostle Paul, like if you read through the book of Philippians, for example, you'll see that uh, Paul wasn't just some nobody, all right? He was in every way part of the elite class of his culture. Paul was a young, up-and-coming religious zealot who had, in many ways, begun to surpass some of his own teachers and mentors. He was next in line for the place of power and prestige and influence in his day. And then one day, Jesus meets the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, right? And he instantly changes his life. He radically alters everything about his identity. So now all the things that the Apostle Paul once cared about and loved and esteemed and valued and pursued, he now despises. He actually calls it all rubbish. And now what he once despised, namely Christ, he now loves supremely. 
and is willing to suffer the loss of everything for him. I mean, you think about what the Apostle Paul lost in pursuit of Christ. He had lost every earthly advancement that he had ever made up to that point. He lost the respect of his friends and his elders and his peers. He sacrificed friends. He sacrificed family, his home, his health, his freedom. And why? He did it all for the cause of Christ, right? In fact, if you read the Apostle Paul in his own words, he says this. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Why, Paul? Why would you do that? He says this, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. Why? In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which depends on faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And so now as Paul appeals to Philemon to forgive Onesimus, he draws his attention to his own suffering for Christ so that Philemon would be motivated. Did you see it there? Not by compulsion, but of his own accord. Listen, when we rightly understand the gospel, when we rightly understand what God has accomplished for us in Christ, when we remember how far away from God we were and how entirely destitute of any way to make ourselves right with God, but then he then bridged an impossible chasm to reconcile us to himself, when we rightly esteem him as supremely worthy of everything we could give him, and when we understand the radical nature of his love and his grace and his kindness to us, listen, it makes us eager, it motivates motivates us so that we would even be the kind of people that would pursue every opportunity to lavish charity on anyone, and most especially those who have most deeply hurt us. I mean, this is radical. This is audacious to consider. Not that you would sort of sit here this morning under the preaching of the word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then leave here and kind of begrudgingly capitulate and say, fine, God, I guess what the preacher man says I have to forgive and you say I have to forgive, I'll go ahead and forgive, but I, I don't really want to forgive. That's not how Christians forgive. No, we are those who have received forgiveness that we didn't deserve and that we could never earn. And we recognize that even the deepest wounds that others have caused us pale in comparison to the ways that we have sinned and rebelled and betrayed and wounded the heart of God, and we eagerly and joyfully and oftentimes with tears running down our face, but for the glory of Christ, we lavish the grace and the charity that we have received from God on others because our priorities have been radically altered by the grace of God that marks our lives. Wounded, mistreated, abused, maligned Christian. Would you hear the heart of God this morning? He loves you. And listen, God himself is committed to your highest and best joy. He is even more so committed to that than you are this morning. You have a good, good father. And when he calls you to forgive, it is not out of some twisted desire to somehow add sorrow to sorrow. It is to liberate you from the misery that unforgiveness produces. You think people that withhold forgiveness are happy? They're not. They're miserable. No matter what you've been through, I promise you, Christian, until you forgive, you won't be free. You will only ever be trapped in what the scripture calls the gall of bitterness. And the writer of Hebrews says that bitterness, it defiles everything. In fact, I ought to remind you, Christian, as Nick did even last week, that Jesus in Matthew 18, as he relates the parable of the unforgiving servant, he warns all who follow him that if they withhold forgiveness from any, that they should have no confidence whatsoever to believe that they have received forgiveness from God. In fact, speaking on forgiveness in Luke chapter six, Jesus says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And James says in James two, verse 13, he says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Then he says, mercy has triumphed over judgment. And the good news for you, follower of Jesus, is mercy has triumphed on the cross. And you can have confidence 
this morning that you can eagerly pursue the dispensation of charity even on those who have wounded you because of the grace of God that is active toward you in your failure and because you know, listen, you can be confident and know that one day your heavenly father is going to set all things right even as he is right now in this moment, the Bible says, bringing all things in subjection to himself. And so our forgiveness, if we will give it, if we will eagerly give it, it will be because we are motivated by radically altered priorities. First, that love is now our preference. Secondly, that charity is now our pursuit. And finally, that salvation is now our perspective. Look back down at verse 15. He says, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This is awesome. I've been praying this week that God would cause us to be a church family that thinks this way. Paul says, um, I want you to just consider this for a moment, Philemon. Consider the fact that God, who is sovereign over you and me and Onesimus in this whole situation, consider Maybe that the reason that all of this happened, the reason that Onesimus caused all of this difficulty in your life, maybe it was so that God would save him. Maybe it's so that God would transform his life like he's transformed your life and my life. And he would become to you more than he had ever been before. He would no longer be a bondservant. He would be like a brother to you. You know, Nick mentioned last week that oftentimes people will uh, read the letters of Paul here specifically where he talks about things like slavery. And they'll, they'll wonder, you know, why didn't Paul just say like, you know, Philemon, I don't know if you know, but like slavery is not cool. So maybe you should just like get over it. It's no big deal. Maybe consider you are the problem. In fact, why doesn't Paul deal with the slavery issue head on at all anywhere? Here's why. Every injustice that you can think of, be it slavery, abuse, abortion, all of it, all of it is downstream of a sinful, fallen, and broken world system. And God, who we just talked about, is in the process of making all things new, of bringing a restoration to all things. The Bible says bringing all things in subjection to himself. How is he doing that? Is he just snapping his fingers and pop? Things are in subjection to him? How is he accomplishing that? Well, he's doing it through the proclamation, the acquisition, and the application of the gospel, which is the message that salvation is possible through the belief in the life, death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus on the cross. And it is then our submission to him as Lord of all. It is through that message and the spread of that message that evils like slavery and abuse and all the rest are being undone. In fact, just as a historical footnote here, in case you were wondering, it just so happens that the biblically informed Christian worldview is the worldview that has worked throughout history to bring about an end to slavery everywhere it's ended, including the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in the early days of the American experiment. In fact, it was Christian abolitionists who believed the Bible that worked to advocate for the dismantling of chattel slavery, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, because it is only the Christian worldview that advocates consistently a commitment to the principles of justice, equality, and the inherent dignity of every human life from the moment of conception, and every other worldview that does so borrows from the capital of the ethics and the morality taught in the scriptures. Back to Philemon. The most important thing for Paul, and what Paul wants to call Philemon to rise to, I believe, and what the Holy Spirit intends to call us to rise to is this. That salvation, that God's saving and his forgiving, even those who have most deeply wounded us would be the most important thing to us. And so the question is, is salvation our perspective? I mean, when you... When you come in here on Sunday morning and you celebrate and you anticipate the final experience of our hope that one day we will be gathered together with believers of every tribe and nation and language and tongue, do you consider that standing shoulder to shoulder with you would be those who have most deeply wounded you? Those 
names, those people that have been running through your mind this morning as I've been speaking? Are you eagerly anticipating the day when they will repent of their sins as you have, when they will place their faith and their trust in Jesus as you have, and they will receive the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the love of God as you have and been made right with them and then take their place with you before the throne to sing, worthy are you, Jesus, for you were slain and by your blood, you ransom people, even us, for God, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth forever. Do you pray for such things to happen? May it be for each of us who have received the radical, audacious love and forgiveness of Christ that salvation would become the lens through which we view even the hardest things we do for the name of Christ. As we prepare to wrap up. We're going to do a learning to live here in a moment. Christchurch veterans, if you've been around for a while, learning to live is back one week only. Nick's not here, so we're going to do it. (laughs) I don't know about next week though. That's on him. Let me just give you a few verses. I want you to jot these down and you can take these home, maybe commit them to memory, but I just want to give you some verses to think about. First Peter chapter two, verse 19 and 21 Peter says, this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. God, I'm, um, I'm suffering unjustly and I've got sorrow. What do you think about that, God? I think that's a gracious thing, he would say. Why is that? Verse 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. Romans chapter five, verses two through five, he says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. That's weird. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Or Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 11 and 12, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice! Be glad! What are you bent, Jesus? What do you mean rejoice and be glad? For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May salvation be the perspective that marks us so that we would be people that forgive motivated by radically altered priorities. Amen? Amen. Well, we like to say here, we, again, we used to like to say, we don't say it anymore, but we're going to say it today. Uh, we don't just learn to learn, we learn to live. So let me give you a few questions to think about. Number one, have I received forgiveness? If you're a guest in this room and you don't know Jesus, the answer is no. You haven't received forgiveness because the Bible is clear. The only way that we receive the forgiveness and the grace and the loving kindness of God is when we repent of our sins, we turn away from any way to make right. We don't try and stack up all of our good deeds. We don't try to make sure our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds. We don't try to just stop doing a whole bunch of bad things. We repent. The Bible says we turn away from our sin. We turn away from any ability or any effort on our part to make ourselves right with God. And we place our faith and our trust and our confidence in Jesus and in Jesus alone and what he has accomplished on the cross and through the victorious empty tomb. And we submit to him as Lord, and then we receive forgiveness. Some people, they'll say like, man, I've was fallen to Jesus since uh, I was really, really young, and he was my savior, but uh, he never really became my Lord. Nope, it's a package deal. You don't do the savior and then add the Lord package on later on. He is either savior and Lord, or he is nothing. And so if you haven't repented of your sins, if you have not embraced Jesus by faith, listen, do that today. Do that right now. You don't have to walk an aisle or talk to a pastor or talk to a priest or sign a card. You don't do anything magical. You can do it right there in your seat. You can turn to God, you can repent of your sins, you can place your faith and trust in Jesus, you can submit to him as Lord, and you can receive the free gift of eternal life because of what Jesus has accomplished in your place. Do it now if you haven't yet. Secondly, how do I need to seek forgiveness? And I wanna give you two really practical things under this point and the next one before we go that I I hope will help you as you both 
uh, seek forgiveness and as you give forgiveness. So first, how do I need to seek forgiveness? Some of you have been hearing me talk this morning and you're thinking, man, I'm good. I, I don't have anybody I need to forgive. But maybe that's because you're the person who's always upsetting people all the time and you're actually the one that needs forgiveness. Man, you've been sitting there and you're thinking like, man, I'm really glad she's here. I'm really glad he's here because they need to forgive me that thing that I did. But you haven't sought forgiveness at all. So let me give you some uh, biblical components of forgiveness. Biblically speaking, forgiveness has three components to it. And I'm sorry is not it. I'm sorry is fine if it's the running start to all of this, but uh, the scripture pictures much more. There's three components, confession, petition, and restitution. First, confession. Uh, Confession, the word in the Bible, when we confess, it means to say the same thing. It means to agree with. It means I agree with you that there is some wounding, some damage done through what I've done. Maybe through something I've said, maybe the way I've talked to you, maybe something I've done. Confession isn't uh, the time where I equivocate. I don't justify. I don't make excuses. I say, man, I, I, know I, I know I talked to you in a way I shouldn't have. I know I behaved in a way I ought not to have. I know I said that thing. I know I called you that name. Man, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. You confess. You say what you did. You don't make excuses. You don't blame shift. Man, I, I, yeah, I know I talked to you that way, but it was really because you, you upset me. You did that thing you know, you know you're not supposed to do. That's not confession. Confession is we own up to it. We take responsibility. Here's what I did, and it was wrong. Second, petition. This is where you ask. This is, you say what you've done, and now you say, will you please forgive me? And listen, you wait for the answer. The answer might come immediately. It might take a few minutes. It might take a few hours. Maybe it even takes a few days, and they need to sort that out between them and God, the the timing of those things. But the Apostle Paul says, insofar as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. But you confess. You say, will you please forgive me? And you wait for the answer. And then thirdly, restitution. This is, uh, what can I do to make it right? How can I make this up to you? Now, sometimes, uh, you may know, uh, there are no enduring relationships without forgiveness. You've probably experienced that sometimes there isn't anything you can do to make it right. You've already said the words, you've already done the thing that you did, but sometimes there is. Sometimes the answer is, "Don't, don't talk to me that way. Don't treat me that way. Don't act like that. But we need to ask, what can I do, if anything, to make it right? Confession, petition, restitution. And I just want to, as a side note here, young married people, old married people here, aspiring to be married people, people in any relationship here, actually, if we will be a church marked by this, listen, we'll probably save like thousands of hours in counseling. And honestly, one of the best things about my marriage to my wife is that we have a culture that we decided a long time ago before we got married that this would be the culture of our home, that when we failed, when we fall short, when we sinned against one another, as we knew we would because we are both sinners, that we would have a culture. We don't make excuses. We don't blame shift. We don't try to avoid responsibility. We confess. We petition. Will you forgive me? And we make restitution. What can I do to make it right? So how do I need to seek forgiveness? And then finally, who do I need to show forgiveness? Who do you need to show forgiveness? What is the name that's been coming to mind? Who's the person that as we've been talking this morning, you've been thinking about and you're holding on to it. And some of you are holding on to it because you're having a difficult time reconciling the command to forgive with the feelings of forgiveness. You know that Jesus commands you to forgive, but you, you say, man, but, I, but I'm still hurting. And I, I don't feel like forgiving though. And like, I, I'm still upset. I mean, what they did was really, really bad. So, so what do I do? Do I, do I just wait until I feel like it? No, you, you don't wait. Or this funny little thing, we're teaching our son uh, obedience. Obedience is all the way right away with a happy heart. And what's funny is, is that's not just for like three-year-olds. That's for Christians like all the way up the chain. Obedience is all the way right away and with a happy heart. That's how Christians obey. So how do we obey when it comes to forgiveness when we don't feel like forgiving? Here's two things that I think will be helpful. There is what we call the crisis of forgiveness and the process of forgiveness. The crisis of forgiveness is the decision point. You're sitting under the preaching of the word, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you say, you know what? God calls me to forgive, so I'm going to make the decision to forgive. I'm going to release that person. I'm going to release you from the debt that was incurred when you wounded me, and I'm going to forgive. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to release it. God calls me to forgive, and so I'm going to walk in obedience and faithfulness to him, and I'm going to forgive. But then there's the process of forgiveness as you wait for the feelings of forgiveness to come. And the process of forgiveness has three commitments to it. Number one, I won't bring it up to myself. You commit that you're not going to constantly rehearse and rehash the offense over and 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 again in your mind. 
You're not going to do that. I commit. I'm not going to bring it up to myself. Secondly, I'm not going to bring it up to other people. So I'm not going to call my mom. I'm not going to call my sister. I'm not going to talk to my roommate. I'm not going to talk to my friend. I'm not going to talk to my coworker and badmouth you because of the thing that you did for the 10,000th time that you know that you shouldn't do. I'm not going to bring it up to other people. It's a commitment that you make. And then thirdly, I'm not going to bring it up to you. What you did is not a club that I use to bludgeon you the next time that we are in disagreement. I don't whip it out and throw it at you the next time we're in an argument or the next time we're having difficulty together. You make that commitment. I won't bring it up to myself. I won't bring it up to others and I won't bring it up to you. And listen, when you fail in the process, because you will, you're a human, you'll fail. A a memory will trigger and you'll begin to rehearse it all over again in your mind or somebody will ask you about something. You'll be tempted to want to Talk about it in a certain kind of way. When you fail in the process, you return to the crisis. You say, no, I, you know what? I made a commitment. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to leave it to the Lord to deal with. I'm going to forgive and I'm going to let it go. The crisis of forgiveness, the process of forgiveness will help you as you consider those you need to show forgiveness to. Listen, church, I am desperate for us that we would be people who would be radically altered by these priorities. Now, there's one thing that I didn't address, which is this, reconciliation. Now, maybe the final question that's sort of looming for you, man, I've forgiven or I'm ready to forgive, but what about reconciliation? Do I just forgive and forget? Man, I forgive and we're all cool now? And that is an important question. There's some nuance to that. And I'm not going to answer that question this morning. Pastor Nick is going to answer that next week when you come back. And so you come, he's going to address some other things, but among those will be the question of uh, reconciliation. But as we go this week, as we leave this place, may we be people that are forgiving people because we have been marked out. We are motivated by new priorities because of the runaway grace of God that we have received. Amen? Let's pray.